Today we're going to continue through uh, Acts. We've been in Acts now. And uh, this week we're going to be in Acts 3 again. And there's, there's a little bit uh, more I wanted to talk about that didn't get discussed last week. So if you would want to turn with me to Acts chapter 3, we're going to be looking at verses 1 to 10. Beginning in verse 1, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple, the time of prayer, three in the afternoon. Now a man was lame from birth, was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going to the temple of courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, and to John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have. But what I do give you, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them to the temple courts, walking and jumping, praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate of the beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Our passage this morning begins with Peter and John going to the temple to pray. Our story about this interaction with this lame beggar interrupts their plans. And in many ways, as we read this passage, as we read this chapter, it will echo many things from chapter 2. Where the disciples were obediently praying and waiting for the presence of God. In both of these places, the mundane of their day-to-day -day routine is interrupted. Luke here is drawing attention, our attention, to the activity of God in these chapters. And as we notice God's activity, we also notice the activity of the church. The disciples in this passage are being faithful. And because of this, God works through them to accomplish God's redemptive purposes. In, the, in our passage this morning... Peter and John are confronted by a lame beggar. And this man has been lame his entire life. Luke suggests that this man has spent a considerable amount of time here begging. As you would expect, he has all the problems that a lame person would have. It was difficult to do anything. And while we today, we might have some advancements to help alleviate some of those problems those who are handicapped might have to endure, everyone in his shoes in that time and place no such possibility. But Luke's description here is explaining more than we might otherwise gather at a first glance. You see, Luke explains that this man is left out the gate. He isn't even permitted inside. He's an outcast simply because of his disability. Sure, he has a few people that help him get to the entrance, but for all intents and purposes, he is an outsider. Like so many others, from the stories we've read about Jesus uh, healing in Luke, there were questions that might have been around this man's lameness, what sin would have caused it, or was he ritually impure? And whatever the exact details of what this might have looked like for him, all that to say is, not only was he challenged physically, but he was also socially and spiritually challenged. But it's worth noting another observation. You see, when Luke describes people in his writing, his descriptions aren't one dimensional. They, they often share a deeper truth. And let me give you a couple examples. 
in Luke 19, when Zacchaeus is described as being short, it isn't just a description of his physical qualities, it's a description of his character. He's a man of short moral character. Or in Luke 8, when Jesus crosses the sea and encounters the demon-possessed man who lived in the solitary confinement of the graveyard, Luke isn't just telling us where this man physically was. He's describing the desperate state of that man's social and mental and spiritual status. And so while we read this, this passage, we're not just learning about this man's physical problems. Luke is here, is hinting at all these other issues that he is dealing with. Then comes Peter and James on their way to pray. And when the beggar asks for money, they initially reply by saying that they don't have any. As we read in the last chapter, the church had been selling and giving a lot of money away to those in need. And by this time, they were running dry. They had no more to give this man, or so it seemed. And they explained this to him. And they don't leave him hanging. They give him something else, something so much better. Peter commands him to walk and helps him get up. And so the beggar who spent his entire life crippled is healed. The people around them, they see this man and they're drawn to his outburst of praise. The surprise of his, react, of his reaction gives way to shock as they realize that he, the cripple, they have passed countless times. As we unpack this passage this morning, there's a few observations I want to make. And the, the first observation um, that I want to point out to us this morning is that the disciples are on their way to pray. They're being faithful in their walk with Jesus. We will have seen this throughout Acts. In Acts 1.14, we read that they were constantly in prayer as they obediently waited Next, two, we read how they were devoted to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, the Eucharist prayer. Chapter three, we have been constantly shown how the disciples have gathered and encouraged, discipled each other. They were giving freely and looking out for the well-being of others. They were united as they served those in need. Their lives were transformed by Jesus, and it has changed everything about them. Our passage this morning, it only happens because they are going to the temple to pray. They didn't come to pray. It's likely they wouldn't have been there to notice the beggar at all. But I think Luke here is pointing to something deeper. I think we can take this one step further you see, they're not just noticing the man and responding to him because they're at the right place at the right time. Their commitment and love for Jesus means that they were able to notice and respond to the lame man that so many people had ignored as they walked by. It's their faithfulness that brings them to the temple, and that is the same faith that opens their eyes to the lame beggar who's gone, ignored by others. But this, this passage, in this passage, there's a lot more uh, going on than just the disciples going to pray. You see, the beggar walks away healed. And he's not healed because the disciples have some sort of magical ability. The healing was the result of God. The disciples, they didn't will this to, ha to happen. And they had no power in themselves to cause it to happen. 
And they didn't have some sort of mystical power just by saying the name Jesus. The power came not from the name of Jesus, but from the person of Jesus. It happened simply because of God. The disciples could have been there all day, and they could have done a million different things, but unless it came from God, it wasn't going to come at all. And here's the thing about Acts. Now, we might refer to it as Acts of the Apostles. But in light of everything that we've read, even these first three chapters might be more accurate to simply call it the Acts of God. I mean, think about it so far. God was the primary actor in Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit came over the church and empowered it to proclaim the name of Jesus. And here it is the power and the presence of God who heals this man. So as we read this passage, there's two things that are happening. There's two things that work together. We see how the church's faithfulness and the presence of God come together to bring about God's redemptive will. God's redemptive will purposes. God does great, wonderful things. And God's grace, it's not limited by our abilities. God isn't constrained about in whom God is wooing or convicting or healing. But in Acts, in our passage, the movement of God happens primarily through his people. In our passage, God works through the community of believers who are faithful and obedient to the call of Christ. And thus, I think the picture of the church in Acts reveals to us a glimpse of who we are called to be. And so this means that as we read and as we think about the early church's commitment to community, and its practices of prayer, scripture, and sacraments, and to a robust concern for others in need, we see a calling on our lives and on our church. Now, you might say, Pastor, I don't have the power to make the lame walk. And I will remind you that neither did the apostles. The power was all God's. They were called to simply follow the faithful. If you remember throughout the Gospel of Luke, Peter spent his time making some pretty silly choices, saying some pretty funny things. And already three chapters in, we could say that it's different. He is different. And it's not like Peter somehow fixed himself or he's read a couple books and he's made himself stronger. He's different because God, and what God has done, And their encounter with the lame man only happened because they were trying to faithfully follow Jesus. Oftentimes when we read a passage like this, we might get hung up on how cool the miracle is. And it is really, really cool. But sometimes, if we're not careful, we kind of gloss over some of the important lessons in Luke teaching. The church is called to be God's people. And if we're going to live out God's calling, then we cannot rely on our own energy. We can't rely on our own steam. So we've talked about the apostles, but I also want to take a moment to think about the crowd. For them, this day was like any other day. And I'm sure you can imagine it. They were all going on their daily routine. Maybe some of them were working. Maybe some of them were trading. Some of them perhaps going to the temple. They're just people like you. Just going on with their lives. And in the moment, you could probably understand their amazement. Breaking into the mundane activities of their life, something incredible happened. This lame man walked. They are astonished at this miracle. 
But had they known Jesus, would they have been surprised at all? I mean, they're looking at this, and they're seeing what has happened, what has happened, and at least some of them should have known something about it. But they didn't really know Jesus, so of course they're surprised. I mean, sure, a lot of them probably knew of Jesus, but did they really know Jesus? That's why later in verse 12, Peter will ask them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? Points them to Jesus. And it's what they've been missing this whole time. Peter points them not to the miracle, but to the person. And sometimes when we read Acts, we kind of miss a point. But it's like the crowd were often surprised and drawn to the flashy things happening. But it's not about that. It's about Jesus Christ. And as we read this passage, we must not fall in the trap and think that it's just about us. Or what we accomplish. Or what we have done. The disciples' ministry in this passage, it only exists because the Spirit of God has given them a new life. New energy, new vigor. See, the disciples, they didn't go to the temple looking for victories. They didn't go looking for success. They didn't go looking for miracles. They went to pray. They were following Jesus by the power of God's Spirit. And God gave them what they needed for their ministry. In a similar way, we can live the knowledge that God will help us live the people that he has called us to be. Kaylee has spent several seasons coaching volleyball. And when she does, we often have this conversation. I'll ask her, hey, how'd it go? And then she will often share her frustration with players who want and beg to play and then will not show up to practice or put minimal effort in. They, do. they won't commit to work. And then they'll complain they don't get to play in the game. It's crazy. I sometimes wonder if we do the same thing. We'll want God to use us. We'll want God to do something new. And yet, sometimes we'll make prayer. or Bibles, or discipleship, or fellowship, will make all those other activities of our spiritual life, we'll just put them on the back burner. And say, God, I want you to do something new. I want to play in the game. But we don't always show up to practice. Of course, this is where the analogy breaks down. A person might earn their place on a team for working hard, but in our passage, it's not that the disciples have earned anything through their commitment. It's that God's grace is flowing inhib inhibited well, through them, right? It's unobstructed. They're connected to the source. And it's just flowing through them. And when we commit to following Jesus and faithfully center our lives around him, we let the presence of God change our lives and we become a channel for others to encounter Christ. Our passage this morning reminds us of these two deeply interconnected and intertwined truths. The calling for the church is obedience and faithfulness to walk with Jesus and a robust trust and reliance in God's grace. Sustain powers. But I think this challenges us. Because sometimes when we're walking with Jesus, we have this temptation that we need to be the Savior. That we need to fix ourselves or we need to fix or help someone else. And we realize that we can't or we fail or we don't. And so we get disappointed. 
because we can never be saved. And yet, that's kind of the whole point. You don't need to save yourself. And you don't necessarily need to save others. Jesus is taking care of What God is calling you to, what God is calling me to, is the life of faithful obedience. A life of surrender. A life of not putting every spiritual thing on the back burner. And these two things are challenging. Because at first it might seem like they're working against each other, but they're working together. We're giving God everything we have and everything that we are. And trusting that God is going to help us, strengthen us, empower us. To do the things that God has called us to do. May that encourage us and may that challenge us this morning. We pray with me, God, we thank you for today and we thank you for this chance that as we gather, that we are reminded that you have called us to be faithful. God, you've called us to walk with you, to seek you. God, you've called us to serve. But God, we're so thankful that we do not do that on our own. We don't have to do that by our own strength, by our own power. God, we don't have to rescue ourselves, but you have done that. God, may we learn as we walk with you as we know you. May you strengthen us. May you give us new life that we can be your people. We ask that you would go with us now. We ask this in Jesus' name and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If you would stand with me and receive this benediction, as Kaylee has has been doing, put your arms out and receive this benediction from 2 Thessalonians 2, 16-17. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and God our Father, who loved us, and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Go in grace, peace, God. Amen. Amen.